Welcome, dear friends. This is Dr. Shirad Jaitley from New York, uh, your cardiologist on your favorite website, munimeterhealth.com, which is dedicated to educating you about the human heart and its illnesses as we move forward from one video to the other on the two channels we have, Facebook and the YouTube. I hope you're following on both, so this way, just in case if one app is down, you can back up with the other. Thank you again. Without any further ado, I just want to uh, you know, congratulate all my interns, fellows, and residents who are assisting uh, others as well and learning as we move forward and sharing on their sites uh, to help uh, educate uh, and to spread the cause of learning and teaching through this website of mine. I really, really appreciate this. Uh, so without any further ado, I'd like to tell you that today the subject of the talk will be on intra aortic balloon pump. It's called a IABP. And this is a very commonly performed technique now worldwide. We are doing about 22,000, 23,000 uh, techniques in about five years. So average is about you know, four to 5,000 intraaortic balloon pump insertions worldwide. Majority of them, of course, in the United States, but Indian subcontinent, Europe, Asia, the whole of Asia is using it as well as a technique for life-saving measures only. There are a few indications, let's understand, that are very, very important in this setting, and the indications are chiefly in refractory heart failures, for instance, refractory uh, anginas or unstable anginas. Uh, you could use in complex uh, variety of uh, CADs, uh, specifically if they are going for either PCI or they are going for cabbages. And uh, as, a, as a wean-off mechanism, uh, specifically so if you're going to be using it in the setting uh, to uh, post-operatively after the cabbage when you want to wean off these patients off the cardiopulmonary uh, bypass, if you will. Again, here the indication is uh, suggestive of uh, higher mortality, but obviously because these patients were hard, difficult to wean off anyway to begin with because I, either they have a profoundly low LV uh, function and or they had complex coronary artery disease that took longer for them to be you know, so-called repaired within the surgery. So cardiopulmonary bypass, for, for whatever reasons, was a little difficult, and they're trying to wean off, so you could use that. Again, the mortality being a little higher here. <coughs> Excuse me. Cardiac transplants. Patients are waiting on cardiac transplant who are, waiting on the, uh, who are waiting on a list, on the cardiac waiting list. So you have to assess these patients, and they, before, prior to getting an LVAD, a left ventricular assist device, they could use uh, the benefits of an intraaortic balloon pump first. So that, that's where they come in. And then ventricular, uh, ventricular arrhythmias. Ventricular arrhythmias like uh, VTs and then VFs or sudden deaths that have occurred during the ICU, CCU settings. We've converted these patients back into sinus. And you know they are all ischemia related. If these, if these uh, in other words, ischemic cardiomyopathics with uh, uh, cardiomyopathic hearts, they can certainly utilize an intraaortic balloon pump for stabilization till yeah, definite therapy is offered like an ICD or whatever else that you need to be offered. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, let's understand the principle. Well, before we go to the principle, let's understand how it's inserted. Well, this being your heart, this being your aorta, I'm drawing my schematic here as usual. I'm not a great drawer, but I'm learning slowly. And this becomes your descending aorta. Here comes your renal artery and your right renal artery and your left renal artery and then goes the descending aorta right here again and that divides into your iliofemoral, if you will. So essentially a console is uh, sitting here which is monitoring your A-line and which is monitoring your ECG, if you will. So when the catheter is inserted, basically the catheter will go up and have a balloon which inflates here. Now the balloon has a capacity of about 30 to 50 ml only. Now, it contains an inert gas, which is easily resolvable just in case of an accidental rupture of the balloon, just to let you know. So there is no risk of peripheral embolization from this uh, air per se. Now, remember, it has lodged into the descending aorta somewhere here, right proximal to the uh, origins of the renal vessels, and the approach is from the iliofemoral area. So this being the iliofemoral, these being the renal artery, and this being the descending aorta, okay? I've just labeled them quickly here. Now, so this, this is connected directly to the console and it is checking the A-line and it is checking your ECG. So let's draw the ECG uh, for a change, what it looks like. Obviously, it has a P-wave. This is your QRS and a T-wave here. Again, a P-wave, QRS, and then a T-wave here. Then again, we'll draw 
uh, a pause and then a P wave and then a QRS and then a T wave here. And then again a pause and then a P wave and a QRS and then a T wave here. So this is your roughly your RR interval here, an R interval here, an R interval here. Remember that. Uh, as we know from the electrical physiology of uh, the cardiac cycles are timed the following way. At the onset of the R wave, this is where the ventricular systole is just about to occur. In other words, the ventricles were totally in end diastolic phase up until this point, and the ventricular systole begins. So QRS, basically, or QRS is your ventricular systole time. And this is your diastolic. So the repolarization, as we call it, and that's your diastolic phase. So this pause is the diastolic phase between the T, between the T wave and the next P wave. So this is where the diastole is occurring. This is where the systole is occurring. So that completes the entire cardiac cycle. Systole is roughly about 0.3 and diastole is about 0.5 in the entire cardiac cycle of about 0.8 seconds, if you will. Especially if you know that the heart rate is about 75 per minute. Okay. So, you know, again, my interns, fellows, residents, this is a good brush up here. Specifically, my colleagues, my consultants, before they go in, uh, they wanted to prepare for the boards, the recertification, etc. I'm sure there'll be a question in GRE building pump. Specifically, so about the indications, which we just talked about. By the way, we should know the contraindications as well. There are two contraindications. One is aortic insufficiency called aortic regurgitation. It's a no-no. Remember that. That'll be on the boards. And the second is uh, any evidence of abdominal aortic aneurysm or iliofemoral uh, site uh, aneurysms or aortic uh, dissection. If you have had an aortic dissection, which may have healed, etc., again, it's a no-no. You cannot uh, put in a uh, put in an intraaortic balloon pump in that setting because that obviously, you know, uh, it's, uh, the, the consequences will be disastrous. Coming back to the principle now, it's very important we understand the principles here. And that is the RR interval, as I said, the onset of R corresponds with the systole. So what you're doing is you're trying to deflate the balloon during the time when the systole is occurring. So when the systole occurs, right, like this, you want to deflate this balloon. So the balloon goes down. So now, basically, you're deflating the balloon. So the balloon goes down. You're, 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 you're actually allowing the heart to accommodate with the blood about that 30 to 50 cc's per cardiac cycle. So basically, it's an afterload reducer. You can use that as an afterload reducer in that setting. So therefore, what it does is it deflates um, and uh, the it afterload reduces it in the, in the descending aorta. And as a result, the oxygen demand decreases. So oxygen demand will decrease. Now, so that's one principle. So that's one principle. The second principle is it inflates. Now, when does it inflate? It inflates during diastole. Now, because it inflates during diastole, we know the coronary blood flow. Remember, the coronaries are right here. And the coronary blood flow, which is CBF, we call it, that occurs mostly during diastole, correct? As we know. So because that occurs during diastole, you want to inflate the balloon during diastole. So if the balloon inflates during diastole, you're raising the diastolic blood pressure. So diastolic blood pressure goes up, and therefore the coronary blood flow increases. So that's the, infl uh, that's the principle. So it inflates about to 30 to 50 cc's each cardiac cycle during diastole and thereby increasing the coronary blood flow as I say here and thereby it improves the oxygen supply. So what are the two things we have achieved? It decreases the oxygen demand, improves the oxygen supply by deflation and inflation respectively and after the reduction and increasing. So basically it works by two principles. One is coronary blood flow augmentation and second is by afterload reduction during the systole. So having understood these two principles, the contraindications and the indications, let's quickly understand if there are any complications from inter aortic balloon pump that can possibly arise. Well, obviously a laceration of the artery that can occur, whether it's at the iliofemoral junction in the aorta, etc. So it would require a repair, so the patient goes to the OR promptly and then it has to be recognized right, right away by an ultrasound technique or by an MRA, if you will. Uh, again, be cautious. You don't use any dyes or etc. because you know your renal can, renal functions can be compromised. So that's one of the things you have to remember. Uh, infection, wound infections can occur because again you're you're using uh, all of this in an emergent setting. But again, we try to use all aseptic precautions, whether it's in the OR, by bedside, or in the cath lab, or in the 
uh, what have you. So just uh, in the ICU, CCU settings as well. So just remember that wound infection is one of the still uh, problems here. And we have to make sure that this is done very asepti aseptically. Again, it takes about three to five days for uh, for to see the effects, and by then you have to remove the remove the intraaortic balloon pump. There is a technique to remove the pump. Again, proximal pressure does not have to be done first. You could let let it exsanguinate a little bit. So this way, you apply the distal pressure first to the to the uh, to the artery, and uh, in about three to five seconds, there will be some bleeding involved, obviously per cardiac cycle. But then, as soon as you apply the proximal uh, proximal pressure when you're uh, when you're removing the uh, the sheets, then let the let the debris from the distal artery uh, flow out as well, and then apply the entire pressure here for about thirty to forty five minutes. Of course, collect correct. Correct the platelets and correct the coagulation. If there is uh, if there is any uh, coagulation issues, etc., they should be corrected first before you decide to remove the uh, catheter. Because remember, otherwise you'll run into a lot of problems with the post-operative bleeding. So the other other thing is post uh, post removal bleeding that can occur. Exsanguination at times have occurred. Patient has gone back into the into the septic shock or cardiogenic shock. So uh, the timing of removal is very very crucial. How do you try to remove? Well, first of all. Intraatic balloon pump should be timed with every single RR beat. So when you insert, that means the ratio could be one to one first. Then you could do it on every second beat. So now you have it every second beat. So first it was one beat, 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 beat. Now you're occurring beat. Intraatic balloon pump is quiet, but then beats again. So it's one to two. Then you could do it to one to three. You're weaning it off slowly as on day three, for instance. You could bring it down to one, two, three, and then very rarely you'll go to one, two, four, because that's a no-no, because by then you could actually wean off the intraaortic balloon pump. So these are your three wean-off phases, one to one, one to two, and one to three, depending upon what cardiac cycle you like to time it with. You could also choose a 30 cc's or 40 cc's or 50 cc's, depending upon <coughs> the balloon um, capacity that you like to use. But again, you start with 50 ml first because, and then gradually drop it to 40 and 30 because you're reducing the amount of uh, displaced uh, blood within the descending aorta in order to produce the afterload reduction we just talked about and the coronary blood flow increase augmentation that we just talked about. So two principles again, very important. One is afterload reduction during the systole and second, augmentation of the coronary blood flow during diastole is being achieved through the intraaortic balloon pump, a very life-saving technique, and hope you understood that very well during this video discussion. Again, thank you very much for your, for your continued interest and uh, constant attention. And I know I try to give you a lot of information within the video uh, concept of this small uh, vignette, and looking forward to meeting you again on my next video. Thank you again for watching MooneyMeterHealth.com. This is Dr. Shiraz Jaitley.